A Patriot's History of the United States. Chapter 9, Part 15. Total War and Unconditional Surrender. Fittingly, Sherman began his new offensive the day after the election. I can make Georgia howl, he prophesied. With Chattanooga and Atlanta both lost, the South lacked any major rail links to the western part of the Confederacy, causing Lee to lose what little mobility advantage he had shown in previous campaigns. My aim then, Sherman later wrote, was to whip the rebels to humble their pride, to follow them to their inmost recesses and make them fear and dread us. Graced by stunningly beautiful Dixie fall weather, Yankee troops burned cotton, confiscated livestock and food, destroyed warehouses and storage facilities, and ripped up railroads throughout Georgia. They made bonfires of the wooden ties, then heated the iron rails over the fires, bending them around nearby telegraph poles to make Sherman hairpins. Singing hymns as they marched, 5,000 voices could be heard singing, Praise God from whom all blessings flowed. The Yankee soldiers had even Sherman believing God will take care of these noble fellows. Sherman's army had marched to Savannah by December 1864, living off the land. Despite Confederate propaganda that Sherman was retreating, simply retreating, his Western soldiers were supremely confident in their commander. I'd rather fight under him than Grant, and if he were Muhammad, we'd be devoted Muslimmen, said one Midwestern private. Sherman's success produced an uncomfortable relationship with Lincoln. The president wanted him to aid federal recruiting agents in enlisting newly freed slaves into the army. An insubordinate Sherman, however, insisted on using blacks as laborers or pioneer brigades to dig, build, and haul, but not fight. Soldiers, Sherman insisted, must do many things without orders from their own sense. Negroes are not equal to this. Lincoln, unable to punish the one general who seemed to advance without interruption, could only congratulate Sherman on his conquest. On February 17th, Sherman entered Columbia, South Carolina, whereupon fires swept throughout the city, delighting many Unionists who hoped for the total destruction of this hotbed of rebellion. Most evidence points to Sherman's vengeful soldiers as the arsonists. The following day, the Stars and Stripes was hoisted above Fort Sumter. Marching north, Sherman further compressed the tiny operating area left to Lee and Johnson. This was perfectly in sync with Grant's broad strategy of operating all the armies together on all fronts. Every army had orders to engage, a strategy to which Lincoln agreed. Those not skinning can hold a leg. As the end neared in December 1864, President Davis and his wife attended a starvation party, which had no refreshments because of food shortages. Already Davis had sold his horses and slaves to raise money to make ends meet, and his wife had sold her carriage and team. He and other leaders knew the Confederacy did not have long to live, At that late date, Davis again proposed arming the slaves. In a sense, however, it might be said that Robert E. Lee's army was already relying heavily upon them. At the Tredegar Iron Works, the main southern iron manufacturing facility, more than 1,200 slaves hammered out cannon barrel and bayonets. And in other wartime plants, free blacks in Allegheny, Bodecourt, Henry Coe and other counties shaped nails, boilers, locomotives, and a variety of instruments of war. Added to that, another few thousand free blacks actually served in the Confederate Army as cooks, teamsters, and diggers, or in shoe repair or wheelwright work. Little is known of their motivation, but it appears to have been strictly economic since the rebel military paid more, $16 per month in Virginia, than most free blacks could ever hope to get in the South's impoverished 
private sector. Most were impressed under state laws, including some 10,000 Black Virginians immediately put to work after Bull Run, throwing up breastworks in front of Confederate defensive positions. Ironically, some 286 Black Virginia Confederate pensioners received benefits under Virginia law in 1926. The only slaves ever to receive any form of institutionalized compensation from their government. Still, resistance to the use of slave soldiers was deep-seated, suggesting that Confederates well knew the implication of such policies. An 1865 Confederate House Minority Report stated, the doctrine of emancipation as a reward for the service of slaves employed in the army is antagonistic to the spirit of our institutions. A Mississippi newspaper claimed that arming slaves marked a total abandonment of the chief object of this war, and if the institution is already irretrievably undermined, the rights of the states are buried with it. This constituted yet another admission that to white Southerners, the war was, after all, about slavery and not states' rights. Of course, when possible, slaves aimed to escape to northern lines. By 1863, Virginia alone counted nearly 38,000 fugitives out of a population of 346,000, despite the presence of armed troops all around them. Philosophically, the Confederacy placed more emphasis on recovering a black runaway than on apprehending a white deserter from the Army of Northern Virginia. Despite the presence of a handful of Afro-Confederate volunteers, the vast majority of slaves openly celebrated their freedom once Union forces arrived. In Norfolk, Virginia, for example, new freedmen held a parade, marching through the city as they trampled and tore Confederate battle flags, finally gathering to hang Jefferson Davis in effigy. Upon receiving news of emancipation, Williamsburg, Virginia, blacks literally packed up and left town. Blacks from Confederate states also joined the Union Army in large numbers. Louisiana provided 24,000. Tennessee accounted for more than 20,000. And Mississippi blacks who enlisted totaled nearly 18,000. Grant, meanwhile, continued his relentless pursuit of Lee's army, suffocating Petersburg through siege and extending his lines around Richmond. Lee presented a desperation plan to Davis to break out of Petersburg and retreat to the southeast to link up with whatever forces remained under other Confederate commanders. Petersburg fell on April 2nd, and following desperate maneuvers by the Army of Northern Virginia, Grant caught up to Lee and Longstreet at Appomattox Station on April 8, 1865. Following a brief clash between the cavalry of General George Custer and General Fitzhugh Lee, the Confederates were surrounded. I would rather die a thousand deaths, Robert E. Lee said of the action he had to take. Opening a dialogue with Grant through letters delivered by courier, Lee met with Grant at the home of Wilmer McLean. The Confederate general dressed in a new formal gray uniform, complete with spurs, gauntlets, and epaulets and arrived on his faithful traveler. While Grant attended the meeting in an unbuttoned overcoat and boots splattered with mud, no sword, no designation of rank, Grant hastily wrote out the conditions, then noticing that Lee seemed forlornly staring at the sword hanging at his side, decided on the spot that requiring the officers to formally surrender their swords was an undue humiliation. He wrote out, this will not embrace the sidearms of the officers, nor their private horses or baggage. Lee wrote a brief acceptance, glumly walked out the door and mounted Traveler. As he began to ride off, Grant came out of the building and saluted. All the Union officers did the same. Lee sadly raised his hat in response, then rode off. Grant had given the Confederates extremely generous terms in allowing all the men to keep sidearms and horses, 
but they had to stack muskets and cannons. The men had to swear to obey the laws of the land, which would exempt them from prosecution as traitors. Grant's policy thus became the model for the surrender of all the rebels. Fighting continued sporadically for weeks. The last actual combat of the Civil War was on May 26th, near Brownsville, Texas. Davis had little time to ponder the cause of the Confederate failure as he fled Richmond, completely detached from reality. Having already packed off his wife, arming her with a pistol and 50 rounds of ammunition, the Confederate president ran for his life. He issued a final message to the Confederacy in which he called for a massive guerrilla resistance by Confederate civilians. Expecting thousands of people to take to the Appalachians, live off the land, and fight hit-and-run style, Davis ignored the fact that not only were those sections of the South already the poorest economically, thus unable to support such a resistance, but they were also the areas where the greatest number of Union partisans and federal sentiment existed. Few read Davis's final desperate message, for by that time the Confederacy had collapsed and virtually no newspapers printed the news. Davis hid and used disguises, but to no avail. On May 10th, he was captured at Irwinville, Georgia, and jailed. The call for guerrilla war inflamed Northern attitudes against Davis even further. Many wanted to hang him, and he remained in military custody at Fort Monroe for a long time in Lake Irons. In 1867, he was to be indicted for treason and was released to the control of a civilian court. After Horace Greeley and Cornelius Vanderbilt posted his bail, Davis languished under the cloud of a trial until December 1868 when the case was disposed of by President Andrew Johnson's proclamation of unconditional amnesty. By that time, Davis had become a political embarrassment to the administration, and his conviction, given the other amnesty provisions in place, unlikely anyway. And we'll stop here and continue with Lincoln's last days in the next video. Thanks so much for watching. I love you guys. Please reach down, click like, subscribe to the channel, and leave a comment. Love to hear from you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now.